programs, um, government initiatives, whether it's mass development or other agencies, um, don't have a real role to play and are critical um, in the process. But if they're to be sustainable, we need to have um, a for-profit for -profit enterprise, enterprises that are really um, part of the solution um, and on the ground. So what is next to it? Well, we're a merchant bank um, for inner city small businesses. Um, and a merchant bank um, is an organization um, that has existed for centuries. So it's a proven business model um, that really builds a trusted advisor relationships with the companies and the owners of, of those companies that it serves over a long period of time. So we're not about transactions. At the end of the day, we're about relationships. We provide um, a range of high quality business advisory services and access um, to customized financing to urban small businesses, we call inner city small businesses, with revenues between one to 100 million. Um, with a sweet spot of what we say is five to 50 million dollars. And very sound um, business fundamentals. Our role, as I said, is a trusted advisor, um, and that mitigates risk um, and um, long-term strategies that help the company grow. The growth piece is absolutely crucial. People hear the word bank and they think finance. That's how they come to us first off. But the reality is that they need as much help to grow their organizations and to scale them as they do to actually have the money. <coughs> and finally, we would argue that our organization, our model, represents a new institution for a new economy. A for-profit business focused on maximizing the growth, profitability, and success of our portfolio of high-performing urban businesses, thereby enhancing economic development, wealth, and job creation in these markets. So, um, you know, what is the opportunity? Um, you know, Brookings, whose Katz has said that metropolitan areas and the cities within them, and we've heard this earlier in, in the lecture series as well, are the engines of national prosperity. When healthy, these places, and it is about place, um, can advance the economic and social well-being of all residents and the fortunes of the nation as a whole. There are many negative stereotypes, and it's something that we've come across a lot, particularly as we've talked to investing institutions of inner city businesses. They're small. We hear that all the time. Everyone assumes that an inner city business is a mom pop shop, a store, a store a barber shop, a cafe, whatever it happens to be. They're unprofitable. There's, there's no one making money um, in small, small businesses. They're hopelessly stacked if they don't grow. Um, and finally, they're always running um, to stay in place. Reliable data is really, really difficult to come by um, in, this, um, in this area. So let's take a little look at, um, at what we do have um, and um, you know, see whether it builds a strong enough picture to represent um, the sort of opportunity that makes sense. Um, earlier on in the lecture series, we heard a lot about the shifting um, demographic trends. But just to highlight two things that were really important as we look at this marketplace. One is that over the next 20 years, the minority population is expected to grow eight times, eight times faster than the non-minority population to more than 38% um, of the US population overall. Secondly, and this is something that a lot of people don't know, is that more businesses are uh, increasingly being owned and managed um, by minorities. And from 1997 to 2000, which the, again, the data is hard to get, there was an 8%, 25%, and 44% growth in the number of um, black and Hispanic owned and Asian owned businesses, respectively, in the United States. 40% of all US businesses will change either ownership or management in the next 15 years. So think about the demographic shift and then think about what the management of these businesses is going to, be, going to look like and where they're likely to be. Big real estate um, and, big, uh, and uh, retail um, have paved the way. There have been very significant investors um, and developers within the uh, inner city economies. And then we've also had success um, from some uh, investors, um, particularly on the uh, private equity and the real estate side. And then importantly is that we now have a phenomenal political focus, um, which is emanating from um, in Washington, but not just Washington, and also from state government as well, and city government, um, uh, with particularly the establishment of the uh, urban um, policy uh, group um, in the Obama administration, and both 
um, houses are also looking at this um, very closely. So um, specifically, uh, let's look at, at some of the inner city small businesses. There's you know, asked a question as to whether they're there or not. Well, there are more than 25,000 small businesses um, with annual revenue of five to hundred million. Guess what? They're more profitable than the average US small business. So that's something that's kind of an eye-opener when people hear this sort of um, figure. Um, their debt default rates, they're half the average small business debt default rates. And they're one third of those for larger um, uh, businesses uh, across the US. And then of course, the location, um, uh, as we've heard earlier in the series, um, uh, creates competitive advantages. Um, but um, it's, uh, an under, it's an underserved um, uh, market um, and an underutilized um, workforce, which we all um, know very well. Um, ICIC did a survey recently. This was actually um, presented last week, this data, by um, Michael Porter. And there's something called the Inner City 100, which is um, a, a group of the fastest growing companies in inner cities, which is defined as those areas in the US census tract that are low and moderate income. Um, and uh, they've, they've collected data over the last eight or nine years. Um, and what this shows is the, uh, the, the, the the inner city 100 companies, those companies in the database, um, outperformed um, their sector peers um, by a factor um, across all different areas. And you know, there are lots of things that you could argue wrong with the data, but it's kind of um, an interesting uh, trend to look at. Um, in addition, what that survey also showed is that growing, and this is really important, inner city companies can have enormous impact on inner city job creation and inner city economic development. So we know that the net job creation by the 557 inner city 100 firms was 63,000, whereas for a much bigger universe overall, um, there was a net loss um, of 50,000. So it's a, they are, if they're able to grow, a significant engine um, to allow jobs to be created, um, which of course has, um, has much bigger impact as well. So, um, what what do the um, the companies what did the companies themselves say that they needed, um, and what was their impression um, of the services that they currently had? Well, three or four years ago, we ran a series of focus groups with um, small business owners that was done for us um, professionally, and these are some of the comments um, that they made. And I'll just read um, one or two of them. So, most banks are entirely driven by a formula that the front guy can't bend around. I wish they'd just tell you that in the beginning. Um, you know, the one that I like is that banks will lend you money um, when you don't need it. And actually the other description was that they'll give you an umbrella when the sun shines and take it away um, when it rains. Um, so the, the, the fundamental message for us was that there, were, that there was an enormous gap um, that existed between what the companies actually required and needed um, and what um, the financial services institutions and we're prepared to, um, uh, to provide. But what we did also learn is that um, they know what they don't know, um, the owners of these businesses, and are eager to tap intellectual as well as financial uh, capital um, from sources that they trust. So you might say, you know, what is it? Why is it um, that no one's going after this opportunity if it's really as you say that it is, and if, you know, when you put all the data together and connect it, um, then it's really there. Well, um, there's, an imagine, there's an imagination gap um, that actually acts, uh, in my opinion, um, as a barrier to both um, capital um, or access to capital um, and access to advice. Um, so the first thing is, is that it really is um, plain vanilla finance. Uh, banks look at, uh, look at their, um, their, their potential uh, borrowers on a historical basis. They don't look at what the projections are um, or certainly they won't lend against the projections um, on what the potential is um, for growth of the business. Nothing wrong with that um, because it's still in quite um, a good stead. Um, you know, relationship management. Uh, you know, there used to be a banker in every single branch of several bankers um, who were responsible for small business relationships. Well, guess what? For the most part, outside of the community banks and the, um, the credit unions, they've all gone. And that's the result of the enormous amount of consolidation um, and cost cutting uh, that we've seen 
um, in, the, uh, in the banking industry. In addition, they've moved to what I think of as check the box um, lending. If you're a small business and you borrow, um, uh, then the provided you meet the criteria, they'll lend to you. If you don't, then uh, you won't um, uh, be there. Unbeknownst to most people, bank loan denial rates are five to six times higher for Hispanic and African American owned businesses than they are for white owned businesses. That's an extraordinary statistic that comes from the SBA, um, the Small Business Administration uh, itself. Um, CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions, and CDCs, Community Development Corporations, um, do a great job, um, but they are focused primarily on what, what we would call the, the really small market, so the micro market, a million dollars or less in revenue. So they do a very, very good job in that area. Um, but they're not, for the most part, um, involved with what we're now calling the domestic missing middle. Um, so the companies with revenues between three or four million um, and a hundred. Um, and then finally, um, there's uh, limited uh, investor interest um, and a lack um, of business advisory support um, with high quality uh, providers. So for us, um, you know, we're leveraging what we would call a unique con convergence between companies that, that are poised for growth, uh, the imagination gap, uh, and then being in, in the right place at the right time in the sense that this is a problem that we really have to solve um, if our economy overall um, is going to, um, to thrive um, over the next um, uh, decades and for that matter, um, generations. So, uh, you know, in conclusion, um, strong inner city, uh, small businesses are essential to strong inner city economies and ultimately um, uh, will lead to the success or help in the success of building the 21st century city. We would argue strongly that the need and the opportunity is there um, to both revitalize our urban areas, um, we've heard about that earlier, um, as well as create jobs um, for inner city and residents. The challenge, and, uh, Paul Grogan said something very interesting in his introduction remarks in the very first lecture um, and talked a lot about leadership and its importance. Um, and I would say that that is the single most important thing that we, um, as the city of Boston, we as a state, um, and uh, I would say as a, as a nation overall, um, really need um, if we're going to solve um, these sorts of problems. And I, I want to give you um, a specific example, um, because this is something uh, which I think uh, required a lot of political bravery. In 2000, Phil Angelides, who some of you will remember, um, was the, uh, the treasurer um, uh, of California, recognized the importance of the domestic missing middle um, and highlighted the convergence of, um, of what he saw as being two, two key elements. Underfinanced mid-sized businesses and the, and the domestic context um, in launching what was called the double bottom line, uh, investing in California's emerging markets. And he built um, an irrefutable case that California's small to medium sized businesses were suffering from catastrophic from catastrophic and under, under investment with dire consequences for its communities, cities, and the state as a whole. And since California at the time was the world's fifth largest economies, economy, its problem could also have harmful consequences for the national economy and beyond. And what he did was he went out on a limb, um, and it was a highly um, publicized um, spat um, with the investment consultants and with the board of, um, in particular, of CalPERS. Um, and um, uh, argued that, that Calpus was neglecting domestic opportunity to support the missing middle. Um, and um, he you know, made the point that they were investing more than $5 billion a year um, in overseas emerging markets, um, but was completely neglecting um, the domestic um, equivalent thereof, which is in essence the inner city um, uh, marketplace. Um, so he launched the California Initiative um, in 2001, um, and as of February 2008, the initiative had invested or committed almost half a billion dollars, and actually they've now committed another 500 million um, to emerging domestic markets in California. And while it's young, the program, returns are reported at uh, more than 18% um, since inception. In fact, the current head of the alternative group at Caltas has said that it's the second best performing 
um, investment, that, uh, or a series of investments um, that they have. But just as important, and this is really the important part, is that the social returns promise to outstrip any possible comparable microfinance efforts in the US. More than 70% of the California Initiative investment portfolio is located in areas traditionally underserved by capital markets, resulting in the addition of an estimated 3,000 jobs. Employment at the Initiative's portfolio companies grew by 7% in 2006, um, over 2005, compared to a 1% growth um, in the state as a whole. So the, the vision that he had, the, um, the political will that he exhibited in the leadership, um, has resulted in um, significant uh, revitalization of a number of areas um, in California. And then the final thing that I would say is that we need, well, the two final things is that we, we, would, we need to think more about creating innovative private and public partnerships. Um, you know, without working with a mass development um, who do have a lot of money um, available for these types of things, as Paul alluded to earlier, um, it's very difficult to make things happen. Um, they can jumpstart um, the process um, which then leads to the private money having the confidence to come in um, behind it. Um, and so you know, I would uh, argue for, for much more in the way of public-private. And then finally, um, I would uh, argue for us all um, to recognize the need to be more creative around intermediaries. The default position, um, it's no different from the argument about um, the, uh, the number of, um, of towns that we have that we have to, to deal with in the state of Massachusetts. 351 and moving it to 70, the default position is to keep everything in the status quo. And as a result, we're missing um, you know, the opportunity to think about new types of institutions, um, new types of, um, of entities um, that can really transform um, and revolutionize um, the way that our institutions work. Okay, uh, we will reconvene for our discussion after a 10-minute break. Thank you.